Now I want answers to somebody that hasn't been on the show before, Andy Spinelli. Andy is the vice president and the superintendent of building and grounds for the uh, uh, Continent uh, Railway Museum. And I found out about the museum uh, because there was a, a motor car that I saw a picture of. And I thought, gee whiz, I want to build that. So to get more information about it, I found out that uh, it was at this museum. And then when I contacted the museum, I got in touch with Andy. And Andy, by the way, had been maintaining this car for a long time. So he offered to send me the plans for it and to, uh, to help, any, uh, help me with any questions that I may have. So we started talking about his museum and I asked him to be a guest on the show. So Andy, welcome. I'm so glad that you're able to be here this evening. And I wondered if you could tell everybody about it a little bit and what it's all about. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really a neat museum. Uh, I mean, we probably have all been to railroad museums before and you ride the train and go in the gift shop. Uh, the neat thing about our museum is, is it's a, an old line. It's a branch line that was built off the Chicago and Northwestern. So it's kind of like going to the East Broadtop. Uh, everything is kind of in place as it was 100 years ago. Uh, and, you know, the line became abandoned. It first ran to a, a town, a mining town. They mined uh, ore and extracted the red pigment from the ore. And after about 12 years, they, they went belly up and abandoned the line. And then a few years later, they discovered quartzite. So they opened the line up and added on. And uh, they were hauling quartzite out of the old quarry until 1960. Uh, the line was first built in the late 1800s. So it's like the tans of time have just stopped in North Freedom, Wisconsin, uh, until we bought the place in 1963, uh, and we've been there ever since. Uh, our museum started in '59, and uh, it's it's funny you talk about the the modeling and uh, scratch building. Uh, the way we started was collecting wooden railway cars. The railroads, as we know, was lining them up in sidings and setting them on fire. They'd come back a few weeks later with a magnet, pick up the metal pieces, and they were gone forever. So our uh, our founders wanted to preserve those cars for us to be able to enjoy. And uh, they started collecting wooden railway cars. And after a few years, they wanted somewhere to run them. What fun is having a bunch of cars sitting on a siding? So uh, we purchased this, this abandoned line, and uh, we have been rebuilding and restoring ever since. Uh, so we picked up, you know, multiple steam locomotives and diesel locomotives and rail cars, freight cars. We're primarily a wooden car museum. Uh, we do have some steel cars and some more modern equipment. World War II is kind of the cutoff of the museum. Uh, anything after World War II, we don't have any bi-levels or SD40-2s or anything of that nature. It's pretty much old Alcos, EMDs, and then steam power. Um, like I said, the neat thing about the museum, uh, there's a bridge, you got to go drive over the Baraboo uh, River to get to it. And it's kind of like going through gates. It's like going through uh, into Oz. All of a sudden, everything turns into color. It goes from black and white into color. And it's really rolling back in time. Um, I'm on the train quite often. And it's amazing how many people come and ride the train. And they're frustrated because we don't have a Wi-Fi signal and they, they can't use their electronic devices. And uh, it's kind of really because we're, we're tucked in the hills and all of a sudden you're out in the middle of nowhere when you're on the train. You can't see cars. All you see is nature. Uh, you see just what the train crew saw 100 years ago. Uh, the, the landscape has been untouched. So it really makes it a special uh, place. I have fallen in love with Midcontinent. I've been visiting probably since the 90s, but I didn't get heavily involved until probably around uh, 2008. Uh, we had a, a major flood up there, and the museum was almost going to go bankrupt and go away forever. And I thought, boy, this is something that really needs to be preserved for the future, uh, for people to go to and experience. Uh, you could go on YouTube and, and look at videos. Um, you know, you can see slides and pictures online, but there's nothing like the feeling of actually being there 
riding on sectional rail uh, in uh, 19 teen cars, hearing the wood creak, uh, smelling the, the smell of coal. Uh, it's really a three-dimensional museum. It sounds fantastic. Where exactly is it located? Just outside of Baraboo, Wisconsin. Uh, so, so, go ahead. Bar Baraboo is about 45 minutes from Madison. Uh, so again, we're called the Mid-Continent Railway Museum because uh, it's kind of, it, it, it's, it's the middle, Midwest is what we focus on. Uh, not that we have anything against Eastern or Western railroads or uh, the Southern or railroads like that, but it's, it's basically uh, CB&Q, Milwaukee Road, and a lot of the little short lines uh, that existed that went away very quick. Uh, East Jordan and Southern. Uh, we have the only East Jordan and Southern rail car in existence. Uh, there's several other small little branch lines that maybe only had a, a couple cars or a couple locomotives. And uh, again, our forefathers decided to start picking this stuff up uh, when, when it was being junked. And uh, it's really quite rare today to be able to have something or a piece from a railroad that might be the only piece that's left in existence. I, I would think so. When's your museum open? Uh, we're open Mother's Day uh, through the end of October. And then we open up for, we do two Santa trains, a uh, week of uh, Thanksgiving and then the week after Thanksgiving. Then we're, we're closed until Mother's Day. Gotcha, gotcha. Anybody have any questions for Andy about the museum? Well, what, one last thing at the museum, you, you brought up the motor car. Yeah. And uh, the reason why I took that on is I feel it's the most historic thing we have at the museum. It's truly a Smithsonian piece. Yeah. Uh, what happened was EMC, Electromotive Corporation, uh, they started in Cleveland, Ohio. And uh, they were buying cars from the St. Louis Car Company. They hired Thomas Edison and uh, his, his, his lab staff, uh, and one of the individuals, his name was Herman Lemp, to come up with an electrical control system. So Edison came up with the propulsion system. Uh, EMC bought car bodies from St. Louis Car Company. They bought engines from Winton, and they started building these gas electric cars. They wanted to put uh, the steam locomotive out of business. And what was really neat is... General Motors was always playing second fiddle to Henry Ford in the Model T. Uh, Ford Motor Company, they, they had everything right. Uh, Henry Ford owned his own rubber plants. He made his own gaskets. He made his own fasteners. And General Motors, they, they were always second fiddle in the auto industry. And GM saw what was going to happen with this technology. They saw thousands of steam engines were going to be replaced in very short order and of course they saw opportunity knocking. So what happened was General Motors bought EMC and became EMD, Electromotive Division, Division of General Motors. And that is the largest manufacturer uh, of diesel electric locomotives in the world. Uh, and they put the steam engine out of business. Well, that comes full circle because we have the oldest EMC piece of equipment in existence and it is almost 100% original, unmolested. Uh, it's a true time capsule. It was bought by the Great Northern uh, in 1923. And what they did was they used that car uh, as a test bed to see how they performed uh, maintenance costs compared to the steam locomotive. And so they, they ran the car 24 seven for 30 days and they reported to the board of directors that there was over a 50% savings running this car versus running a steam engine. The car was double-ended, so you didn't have to turn it on a turntable. You didn't have to coal it. Uh, maintenance was, was quite simple. Uh, so with that, uh, Great Northern ended up buying quite a few cars, and then the other railroads followed. Uh, CB&Q, uh, the Union Pacific all bought similar cars after ours. Uh, our car was then uh, traded to the Montana Western. Uh, they ran in Conrad, Minnesota, 
and it was an interchange line. And again, it was just like North Freedom. It was a 20 mile line that was remote. And because of that, the car saw very little use and, and was not beat up. Uh, they traded it back to the Great Northern in 1966 and uh, Great Northern ended up donating it to us. And we actually took the car out to EMD uh, for some of the anniversaries. Uh, tens of thousands of people have actually toured the car. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's like I said, a, a Smithsonian piece. And, uh, but it was sidelined because the Winton engine started uh, mechanically failing. Yeah. And we've been very fortunate there are currently no Winton operating engines in the United States, but we ended up getting a, a, a huge surplus of new old stock parts, probably enough to build four or five Winton engines. And we have just contracted with a company called FMW, and FMW currently has the, the Winton uh, in their possession, and we are rebuilding it. So this car in uh, probably about a year or two will be back up and running uh, up and down the line for special occasions. Oh, that's something. That really is special. Well, Andy, I appreciate you telling us about the museum. How about your own railroad? You're, a, you're an HO scaler. Yeah, I got my started uh, back when I was a kid watching the Model Railroad series on PBS. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'm actually fortunate because Alan McClellan with the Virginian, Ohio, and Don Santel, his, his best friend with Ohio, Michigan, and South Shore, I actually own several of their, their pieces that were on their railroad and featured in the Model Railroad magazines and, and movies. Um, but I didn't have the skill set as a kid. So what I did was I joined a club I lived in Elmhurst, Illinois at the time, and I, I joined the Salt Creek Society of Model Engineers. Uh, Salt Creek was formed in 1956. And the reason why I joined is not only for camaraderie, but to learn some of these skills. Uh, you learn from the masters, uh, electrical and scenery and all these different components. Unfortunately, the Salt Creek doesn't exist today but a bunch of the uh, members got together and we started building our own railroads. Uh, I, I currently have a 2,500 square foot empire. Uh, it takes about 20 minutes to make one loop around the track. Uh, we have, uh, we'll probably have about 13 to 15 people in an operating session. Um, and I have two freight yards, uh, kind of just like everybody else, we do a lot of switching. Uh, I've got blue and white lights, so we go from uh, run a, a, a four-hour uh, switching session in 24 hours. Uh, so we take the 24 hours and make it four hours. We go from dawn to dusk. Makes it very interesting doing switching under blue light uh, conditions, trying to use picks to uncouple cars and that. But uh, I would tell anybody, if you could find a club or a group of individuals to get to, to learn the skill set, uh, not to be intimidated by the skill level or the pricing, uh, because we all had to start somewhere. It's quite interesting because uh, we all revere the uh, Virginian and Ohio and uh, what Alan McClellan did for the uh, the hobby but when you actually look at Allen's locomotives, how simple they actually were and how he constructed them compared to the skill level of what's out there today, uh, it's, it's, it's really unbelievable. Uh, you put a modern, a modern uh, new locomotive or kit bash locomotive next to one of old, uh, Allen's old engines and Allen's looks like a toy. Uh, but but people keep learning and the hobby keeps evolving. Uh, and, and really learning from one another is what's going to continue to grow the hobby. I agree with you 100 percent. That's, that's why I wanted you on the show. I, I, I have the same philosophy about uh, mentoring and, and uh, the growth of our hobby is, is what you're saying right now. Uh, do you do you model a specific period on your layout or, or? yeah i, I kind of model the, the 70s 80s uh it's a freelance uh, it runs basically from uh a, a town called deforest wisconsin 
to about mid-state Illinois. Uh, so we do have some coal and power plants, a sawmill, some lumber yards. It's kind of, again, Midwestern railroading. Um, I do run uh, the Salt Creek. Uh, I've got my own Salt Creek fleet of locomotives. But it's it's kind of one of those uh, free for all. If if you want to run CB and Q or Milwaukee Road, uh, go go on ahead. It's what you like. Uh, if if you're paying for it and it's on your dollar, you should be able to enjoy it. Gotcha. Mentoring, as you mentioned, the mentoring is really big. Um, I I got involved at probably about five years old. Uh, I was downtown Chicago with my dad. And uh, we were riding the uh, the Burlington. At that time, they were still using the old green E9s. And uh, we were going from uh, Chicago to Downers Grove. I'm standing next to the engine. And the engineer looked down and said, hey, you want to ride in a cab? Of course, they don't do stuff like that these days. I crawled into the cab of that E unit, and I was hooked. And uh, even at the Salt Creek, I was mentored by a, a couple. We became really, really great friends um it's it's that learning so if you can take somebody who who shows a little interest under your wing uh you can really inspire a lot of people and that also goes for the museum too uh i was also inspired but i have inspired others at the museum because i always say in the end of the day we never own this stuff we only rent it yeah. we're on earth for a short period of time it's it's kind of the journey and, and what we hand down, not necessarily the uh, monetary items, but the, the knowledge. So if you can mo mo uh, mentor someone and pass down some knowledge, that's the biggest gift you could give anybody. I couldn't agree more. Anybody have any questions for Andy? Andy, it's Pat here. Yeah. Do you have any pictures of that museum by chance? I do. I do, and I can send them to you. Unfortunately, I wasn't prepared with a slideshow, uh, right. but I definitely could could get you uh, some some photographs. Thank you. You have a website too, don't you, Andy? Yep, uh, www.midcontinentrailwaymuseum.com. Uh, uh, another thing that uh, I also collect uh, that's collectible now these days is amusement park trains. <laughs> uh, in Chicago here, we had a place called Kitty Land, and Kitty Land had a 12-inch uh, train that was built by the uh, miniature train company out of Rensselaer, Indiana, and I ended up purchasing that, and that got me hooked, so then I bought a 30-inch train from National Amusement Device, came from a park down in Georgia, and... Uh, the 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 train collecting hobby is uh, you could go for the big stuff, you could go for the models, you could build your own seven and a half inch gauge, or you could collect an actual built train that was to haul people uh, for for revenue service, but a little smaller. <laughs> Sounds like you're heavily involved in a lot of different areas. The whole the whole family is. This has been a family. My wife gets involved up at the museum and my kids. My kids are involved in the operating sessions, modeling. Uh, the, the whole family has is, is really been involved in this. Fantastic. Andy, thank you so much for joining us this evening and telling us about uh, what you're doing as well as the museum. I really do appreciate it. And uh, uh, hope wish you the best of luck with your uh, museum. It sounds just fantastic. Thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you.